Welcome to Bible Church of Lakeshore this morning for our morning service. It's good to have uh, many of you now joining us through Zoom, joining us for the Sunday School with Jim. And of course, if you missed that, I'll be posting that after this service to YouTube. And we have our YouTube channel there, about, uh, Bible Church of Lakeshore. I encourage you to check out um, our services from about the last six weeks now. And uh, when we return to the church, perhaps we won't continue to use that mean. Perhaps we'll just go back to record the recordings that we post on our website. We can find older recordings there. There's the audio. But uh, it's good to have you joining us through Zoom this morning as we're gathering in our homes, as we've been for many weeks now. Looking forward to a time when we can gather in person. And I hope many of you will be able to come out at that time in the future. You know, when we look around us today, in Maryland here, or in the United States in general, or around the world, as we look around us, it's easy to ask, why? What? I don't like the new normal. I don't want a new normal. I want the old normal. I want to go back to uh, a return to normalcy. Um, looking forward to that, and especially, of course, concerned about how all of this affects our freedoms, our, especially our freedom to live out our faith and here and to gather together to encourage one another. You know, I believe we'd all greatly benefit by stepping back in this moment right now where, where we find ourselves in the history of our country and really the, the history of the church, the history of the world. To just stop, step back, and examine our relationship with God, examine his word this morning, where we find in Jeremiah, where we were the last couple of weeks, in the next chapter here, chapter five, two questions, two powerful questions worth considering this morning. And so my message this morning is titled, Two Powerful Questions to Consider in Jeremiah chapter five. If you would turn with me in your Bible, I, I'm preaching from the King James Version this morning in the book of Jeremiah, chapter 5. We'll also get to chapter 6 this morning. But starting down at verse 19, I actually want to start right here toward the middle of this chapter and then go backwards and come back and go forwards from there. Because that's where we find the first question. God asks his people. Here in Jeremiah 5, two questions, which are worth us stopping and considering for ourselves today. Verse 19 of Jeremiah 5, And it shall come to pass, when ye shall say, Wherefore doeth the Lord our God all these things unto us? Then ye shall answer. Now, does that mean it's the same answer for us today that when we ask the question, why is God doing, why is our God allowing these things to happen? Why is God doing these things around us today? Is it going to be the same answer? Perhaps not. Perhaps not. But it's worth considering. It's worth looking at because God gives us the Old Testament as an example for us today to learn from. And so let's learn. Let's learn from these examples here in the Old Testament. Let's learn from the example of this question that God says when his people have been taken into captivity, when they have been oppressed, when they have lost the battle, they've lost the temple, they've lost their city, they've lost their freedom. When they've lost everything, they're going to ask, why? Wherefore? It's like saying, why uh, has, our, has the Lord, our God, wherefore doeth the Lord, our God, all these things unto us? In other words, why is our God doing these things to us? And so he gives the answer here in the verse 19. Then shalt thou answer them. 
like as ye have forsaken me and served strange gods in your land, so shall ye serve strangers in a land that is not yours. Now, of course, we don't find ourselves in quite that same predicament today, but we, we find ourselves in a predicament. We have a lockdown. We have the economy uh, losing many, many jobs, some of which may not come back for, for years. We, as, as the soon to be seen, we're, I'm praying that the economy will open soon, that people will be able to regain their jobs, that people will want to go back to work, that people will uh, be productive, and that we'll see this country grow even stronger. And that with that strength, the church also will, will, will use God, what God blesses them with to continue the, fulfilling the Great Commission at home and abroad. That this will motivate us, this time to step back and consider all of these questions will motivate us to draw closer to God and to really be more dedicated, more on fire, more focused on what is really important, more focused on obeying God, more, more focused on following God, loving others, serving God, fulfilling our calling for our personal lives, our calling for our church, and becoming more like Christ. So let's go back to verse one now. With this in mind, with this verse in mind, why is God doing all these things here to Judah? And we can learn from that. Why is God allowing all these terrible things to happen to his people, Judah? Because they have forsaken God. They've left him for other gods. And when we consider our own country today, yes, we're, we're different. We're not Judah. And even when we consider the church, the church is not Judah in the same way Judah was. But today, what is the greatest sin in our country? What is the greatest sin for Americans? What is the greatest sin for Christians today, especially in America, where we have more temptations to this? Well, I believe we could say it's idolatry putting something in place of God, where something is more important to us in reality, in effectiveness, than God is. Whether it's money, whether it's relationships, whether it's a career, whether it's fame, whether it's what people think of us, if something is more important to God, more important to us than God, we're in trouble because we've, we have some other God before him. That's the first of the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not have any other gods before me. Now, in the Old Testament, of course, these would be sometimes literally pagan gods, counterfeit gods, but it's something that was taking the place of God. They were worshiping, they were praying to, they were focusing on, they were sacrificing to, they were living for instead of God. And it was a God that they would set up that would allow for the way they wanted to live. And we have that today with, uh, you know, humanism, atheism, many other religions as well that allow for what God does not allow. And even within Christianity today, you have sometimes an image of God presented. And that is the second commandment. The second commandment is make no graven image. And sometimes we have an image to God, not just a picture like you have behind me, that is worshipped, but an image of God, an imagination of God. So an image of God in our minds that, well, he's a loving God. He's an understanding God. He's a merciful God. He's slow to anger. And we, and we take only the things about God we like, like coming to a buffet and only picking the foods you want and saying, okay, my God is this. I'm going to reject those other things that the Bible talks about about God or, or just say, well, that was the Old Testament. But no, the same God who is God in the Old Testament is the same God who is God in the New Testament. He's the same. He's just as much a loving God, a merciful God, a forgiving God as in the Old Testament as he is in the New Testament. In the New Testament, he's just as much as a just and holy God to be feared, to be reverenced, to be worshipped first of all in our lives as he is in the Old Testament. But of course, there's further revelation. And as we look back as the church today, now that we've seen Jesus, God in the flesh, come and take our place on the cross, we have a greater appreciation, perhaps, than they had with just the picture of the lamb being sacrificed on the altar for their for the sins in the, in, in the Old Testament. But as we saw in Jim's Sunday school class today, 
You know, the blood of animals doesn't take away sins. It was only a picture of what was to come. And now that we have more clearly been given that picture of God's mercy, of God's love, but also of his holiness and justice that he, Christ had to die in our place. He had to shed his blood for us. We have that greater picture today. Looking back, how much more accountable are we today with free access to the, all of God's word as Judah was accountable then as God's chosen people with prophets physically speaking to them, but they didn't have the New Testament yet. All they had were the law of Moses, the prophets, some of the history that they had recorded in the books of first and second Samuel at this time. And Jeremiah physically bringing God's message to them. And God held them accountable for what he gave them. And, you know, as we saw, in Jim's Sunday school class today, you know, it's appointed to men once to die and after this to judgment. We're all going to stand accountable for what we've done with God's word, with the time we've been given in this life and what God has revealed to us and made available to us in his word. Should we choose to read it and obey it? It's there for us. So let's look at verse one now in chapter five of Jeremiah backing up. Run ye to and fro. Through the streets of Jerusalem, and see now, and know, and seek in the broad places thereof, if ye can find a man, if there be any that executeth judgment, that seeketh the truth, and I will pardon it. Pardon what? Well, I believe we can go right back to verse 19. The forsaking of God. God is ready to pardon and to forgive if they will just turn back. We saw that last week in our study of the previous two chapters in Jeremiah. In my message last week, which was turn to God, God was calling on Judah, and he's calling on us today to turn to him. And Judah had that opportunity, and they neglected it. Josiah, King Josiah, did turn to God for a time. But then his sons after him would forsake God once again. But God says he's ready to pardon their sin. Specifically, as we saw in verse 19, they're forsaking him. And yet he's willing to pardon if he can find men in Jerusalem who execute judgment. They're just. And seek truth. So they're honest men following after God. And that's apparently not what we find in Jerusalem at this time. The, the men were not honest. They were not sincere. They were not following God's truth. But rather, what is convenient for them? What works out for them? What's in it for them? And if that's worth following a, a, a God of their own image some other god well they were willing to follow that instead of putting god first and really being someone who is seeking truth and executing judgment so look at next verse then verse two and though they say the lord liveth surely they swear falsely they're dishonest they're not sincere even taking vows in God's name, the name of Jehovah, here in verse 2, some serious vows, and they're failing to live up to those vows. Whether they're doing it to be seen of men, like we see in the New Testament with the Pharisees, or whether they had an intention of fulfilling the vow and then neglected it, or whether they had no intention at all of keeping this vow, they're just going through the motions, they're not sincere. Maybe they believe God. They believe in him. They know of him. But their relationship with him and keeping their commitments to God is not there. It's, they're swearing falsely. Look at the following verse. Verse 3, O Lord. That's God's personal name. It's all capitals. Uh, o Lord. So, O Jehovah. Are not thine eyes upon the truth? Thou hast stricken them, but, thou, but they have not grieved. Thou hast consumed them, but they have refused to receive correction. They have made their faces harder than a rock. They have refused to return. Therefore, so they've forsaken God and they're refusing to turn back to God. We saw last week in the previous two chapters, Judah was called to turn back to God, but they have, to this point, refused to turn back to God. And that leaves God to do all these things that they're going to ask about later when they're in the Babylonian captivity. And they're going to ask, why is our God doing these things to us? Well, there's an answer. They've forsaken him. 
and they refuse to hear the, the, the warnings, the correction. And are we at a point in our country where we're seeing warnings today, correction today that we need in our personal lives and our personal relationship with God and in the morals of our country, the morals of each of us as individuals doing what is right in God's eyes, not our own eyes, because that is the problem here in Judah. They're worshiping other gods and they're doing what is right in their eyes. They have fallen away from God morally. They have refused to return. Verse four, therefore I said, surely these are poor. They are foolish for they know not the way of the Lord nor judgment of their God. Are we today rich in God? I'm not speaking of material rich. Are we rich in our knowledge of God and his word? And in a place where he can bless us and grow us? Or are we poor? You see, Judah here was poor. They were poor in what they knew of God. Their imagination of God was wrong. Their idea of fulfilling God's law was wrong, or they didn't even care. They thought things were going to be okay. There were other prophets that were even telling them this. Jeremiah is going to be the voice that God sends to them to wake them up. Some of them will. Some of them won't. And in the end, most won't. And because they won't wake up and come back to God, and they have forsaken God, God's going to bring them into captivity. He's going to bring judgment to bring them back to him. Look at verse, verse 5. I will get me unto the great men and will speak unto them, for they have known the way of the Lord and the judgment of their God. But these have altogether broken the yoke and burst the bonds. Jeremiah is looking again to and fro. God has sent him to and fro in the city of Jerusalem. Find the men who are faithful to God. Find these great men. Find the men that are seeking after the truth, that are executing judgment. You know, these men, they've known the word of God and the judgment of God. But no, the men in Jerusalem, they've broken off the yoke of God. It was a yoke to them, and they want their freedom. And today we have a society that wants its freedom. Freedom not to do what is right, but freedom to do whatever it wants. And that's trouble today. We cannot unyoke ourselves from God. We cannot, um, you know, Jesus tells us his burden is easy. You know, when we are submitting to, to God, we find out if we're his, truly his child, if we truly have a heart for God and love him, it's, it's not a heavy burden in a yoke. But people who reject their, a relationship with God as his child, they reject that, they reject Jesus as their savior, that they have a need for that forgiveness from him. They want to be their own master. They want to follow another way and they've broken the yoke, burst the bonds that God, their creator, you know, has that, that, that relationship that we all owe to God. He's created us. He makes the rules. We all answer to him. And if we don't answer to him in this world, we will answer for that after this life. But everyone is accountable to God. Uh, verse six, wherefore a lion out of the forest shall slay them and a wolf in the evening shall spoil them. A leopard shall watch over their city. So God is bringing this judgment. How can he you know, pardon them if they're forsaking him? He must bring the judgment. Israel, as we saw last week in the previous two chapters, has the picture, and it's going to be repeated here, of that of a woman who forsakes her husband. Here in the following verses, we see it could even apply to a man who forsakes his wife and have gone after others instead. In that way, Judah has been unfaithful to God. They've had other gods that they've followed after instead of God. And today, we need to ask ourselves, are we faithful to God? God will be faithful. Are we faithful to him? If we're not, you know, judgment can come. Something that gets our attention as a warning. Or finally, we become unusable and God has to you know, removes our ability to serve him in the way that he wants us to. 
And Israel for a time, that's where they find themselves, unusable to God. And so God brings these things, even speaking here of the wild animals or as, as pictures of the judgment he's going to bring on them. And eventually, yeah, their cities will be literally forsaken and, and a place for wild animals to roam because they're going to be carried into captivity. A leper will watch over the cities. Everyone that goeth out thence will be torn to pieces because their transgressions are many and their backs, backslidings are increased. You might hear that word backsliding today. I don't believe that word should ever be used of a believer. Backsliding. You know, a person who has a false conversion, who, who, who says he's a Christian, but there's no fruit whatsoever. Like the soil in the parable of the sower in Mark 4. That is hardened to the seed and, and will not sprout and the devil comes and takes it away. The word of God or where the soil is hardened underneath. And at first there's a response, a response of joy, but there's no, no depth of earth. There's the rock, hard heart underneath that refuses. And when diff times become difficult, goes the other direction and the, the word dies there, the, the plant, the seed, or the thorny ground where we just get so distracted with the cares of this life that it all chokes out God's word in our life. I believe those are three examples of, 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 of people who are not genuinely becoming a child of God, but they're rather hearing the word of God and not doing it. Our faith should be confirmed with works. Faith without works is dead. And so Israel here is backsliding. God's going to bring them back to him as a child of God. And as a child of God today, if we do fall into sin, God's going to discipline us. He's going to correct us. He's going to bring us back to him like the prodigal son came back to him. He didn't stay with the pigs because he wasn't a pig. He was a son. And so Israel's being called back from their backslidings. Their backslidings have increased. You know, that should never be the case for a Christian. Our backslidings should be decreasing, not increasing. There should be growth in a believer's life. Always should be moving forward. If, if we stagnate, we decline. And that's what happened here with Judah in their spiritual life. They backslid. Their backslidings have increased. Verse 7, and how shall I pardon thee for this? Thy children have forsaken me and sworn by them that are no gods. So again, the sin that God is bringing all these things upon his people is they have forsaken him. They have forsaken him and sworn by them that are no gods. And when I fed them to the full, they then committed adultery and assembled themselves by troops and in the harlot houses. Again, the picture of immorality, the picture of being unfaithful to a spouse is a picture of where Israel is in their walk with God, that they have gone after idols instead of God, like an unfaithful spouse. And, they, and it's without cause. God has not been an abusive spouse to them. God has provided everything they needed. And yet they've been full and wanted more. They've been covetous. And today, you know, in America society, how much can we relate to that in our lives? That we have everything we could possibly need, right? And yet we always want something more, something more, something more. We have to be aware of that. Covetousness, the Bible says, is idolatry. We need to be content with the things we have. We need to seek First, the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Lay up for treasure. Lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven and not on this earth. And so they are fed horses, verse 8, fed horses in the morning. Everyone neighed after his neighbor's wife. Shall I not visit for these things, saith the Lord? And shall my, uh, not my soul be avenged on a nation as this? Again, answering the question, why is God? doing these things to his people here because they've forsaken him. Verse 10, go ye up upon her walls and destroy, but make not a full end. Take away her battlements, for they are not the Lord's. It, Judah, it, Judah and Israel, they are punished. They are disciplined, but there is not going to, it's not an end. It's not over. God's going to bring them back to him. That's why he allows them to go into the captivity. That's why he brings these judgments, terrible judgments upon them. He removes their battlements. He removes their ability to depend on themselves, to be independent, 
to th and to choose, you know, to follow another God. He's going to get their attention, show them. It's he who gave them everything they've been enjoying, and yet they wanted their own way. They went their own way. They forsook God. Verse 11, for the house of Israel and the house of Judah have dealt very treacherously against me, saith the Lord. Treacherously has the idea of uh, fraudulently, deceptively. You know, they say they're God's people and they have not lived up to that. They have not kept their vows. They have not kept God's law. They're God's people in word and name only. They've forsaken him. Verse 12, they have belied the Lord and said, it is not he, neither shall evil come upon us, neither shall we see the sword nor famine. They are deceiving themselves. They're saying that God is not going to allow bad things to happen to them because they're his people. But that's not true because they've forsaken him. Verse 13, and the prophets shall become wind and the word is not in them. They had false prophets telling them that things were going to be okay, telling them that they were going to defeat their enemies and they were going to prosper. But it was wrong now. Thus shall it be done unto them. Wherefore, thus saith the Lord God of hosts, because ye speak this word, behold, I will make my words in thy mouth fire, and this people would, and it shall devour them. What a picture. Fire devouring wood. God's word. Verse 15. Lo, I will bring a nation upon you from afar. O house of Israel, saith the Lord, it is a mighty nation. It is an ancient nation. The Assyrians, the, 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 Babylon, the Babylonians, basically that Sumerian culture that grew and, of course, changed. But that same area that Abraham long ago had been called out from, now they're going to return to that land for 70 years. Whose language thou knowest not, neither understandest what they say. Their quiver is an open sepulcher, and they are all mighty men. And they shall eat up thine harvest and thy bread which thy sons and thy daughters should eat. They shall eat up thy flocks and thy herds. They shall eat up thy vines and thy fig trees. All these things that Israel looked to. And, and, and do we see today how quickly our economy has been eaten up? The food supply, everything, is, is, is it's in trouble right now. Rather self-inflicted here, not by another nation, except through the China uh, allowing this virus to come to us but also the government and the measures it's taken seems to be making things worse for us right now, um, economically. And here, things get worse for Israel. They, they, they were thinking that everything was going to be fine. Everything was well. They were prospering. But all of that can disappear so quickly, as we've seen, and hopefully will not continue to see in our country. Hopefully things will get back uh, to normalcy. What we've enjoyed in the past, but we shouldn't take that for granted. We need to turn to God. We need to examine our relationship with God, make sure he has first place in our life. That's what Israel, that's what Judah needed to do, and they would have to learn to do that by going into this captivity. They shall impoverish thy fenced cities where thou trustest with the sword. They're trusting their military might, but it would not save them. Nevertheless, in those days, saith the Lord, I will not make a full end of you. And it shall come to pass when ye shall say, Wherefore doth the Lord our God do all these things unto us? Then thou shalt answer, Like as ye have forsaken me and served strange gods in your land, so shall ye serve strangers in a land that is not yours. They had to have the reason. And, and you see further reasons in the following verses here. First, they've forsaken God. We've seen that already throughout this first part of the chapter. They have forsaken God, and so God has done these things to his people. Then verse 20, declare, declare this in the house of Jacob and publish in Judah, saying, Hear now this, O foolish people, without understanding, which have eyes and see not, which have ears and hear not. The second reason, besides they have forsaken God, that these things are being done to them by their God, is they have refused to fear God, to hear his warnings to them. Look at the following verses. Hear now this, O, o foolish people, without understanding, with have ears that see not, and have ears that hear not. Fear ye not me, they have, they have failed to fear God. Sayeth the Lord, will ye not tremble at my presence? 
which have placed the sand and the bound of the sea, a perpetual decree it cannot pass. And through the oh, waves that should, uh, thereof toss themselves, yet cannot prevail. They roar and yet they pass not over it. Sometimes the things we take for granted, the fact that the sea is contained in the sea, it doesn't come and swallow up the earth in a great flood like it once did. You know, it, it beats upon the sand, the tide goes in, the tide comes out, but it stays in the ocean. And sometimes we take that for granted, but God is the one who's in control of that. And he, allow, he allows the moon, you know, there's so many things that could go wrong in the world catastrophically. And now, you know, this virus is just one little example around us. And yet God is in control and, and, and we fail sometimes to appreciate that and to really fear him. And, you know, when people say, well, I have an addiction problem, I have this problem or that problem, instead of acknowledging it for the sin that it is, it's really a problem with the fear of God, not fearing God the way that we should. And so we allow our lives to be entangled in things that they should not be. That's what God's people did here, and that's what he, God has to correct. But verse 23, but this people have a revolting, meaning morally withdrawn they, they have pulled back from where they should be and a rebellious heart they're revolted and gone neither say they in their heart let us now fear the lord they do not have that fear of god that giveth the rain both the former and latter in this in his season and remember we looked at last week god withheld the latter rain the rain that was needed to grow the crops for harvest as a warning to his people to turn them back to him and yet they refuse to see that warning they refuse to fear god who controls the rain he reserved unto the appointed weeks of the harvest. Your iniquities have turned away these things. Your sins have withhold good things from you. So another reason besides they do not fear God is they, their lawlessness, their sin, their iniquity. Their iniquities have turned away these things, the good things that they had once enjoyed. And that's why God is doing all these things, their sin, their iniquity. They're forsaking God, their lack of fear for God, and their sin and iniquity. Verse 26, for among my people are found wicked men, they lay in wait as they set, or they are setting snares. They set a trap. They catch men. A cage full of birds. So are these houses full of deceit. Therefore, they be, they become great and waxen rich. You know, when wealth is gotten through sin, it's not going to be blessed by God. It, God can't use that for good in the future. It's it's a problem, and that's where Judah is finding themselves here where many in America can find themselves today when we're making our money off of things that should not be. Verse 28, they are waxen fat, they shine. Yea, they overpass the deeds of the wicked. They judge not the cause. They caught the cause of the fatherless, yet they, they prosper in the right of the needy. Do they not judge? So the, another re, part of their sin here is they've forsaken the poor. They're, they're not showing the kindness. And, and again, still today, Jesus tells us if we've done it to the least of these, we've done it to him. And so God holds us accountable. Here he holds his people accountable for their sins, including how they treated the poor. Shall I not visit for these things, saith the Lord? Again, the answer to the question, why is God doing these things to us? Shall I not visit? In other words, shall I not do these things? How can I not do these things? Now God is replying essentially by the end of this. How can God not do all these things to his people for what they have done? They've forsaken him. They've failed to fear him. And they've committed these sins and iniquities. And they're even in their religion, in their profession of their walk with God, they're false, as you find here in the, at the end. Verse 30, a wonderful and horrible thing is committed in the land. The prophets prophesy falsely and the priests bear rule by their means. In other words, what, what the priests think, and today we have religions, all the false religions, all the cults, and some even denominations that claim to be a Christian denomination. If they are teaching of men, if they're teaching what men say, not what God says, they're like these priests here that they are ruled by their means, and my people love to have it so. People love to hear what they want to hear, and there are preachers out there that will just say what people want to hear. And that's a big problem. And that brings us to our second question. The second question, and what will you do in the end thereof? What will you do in the end? As a result of everything you've done wrong, and now God has brought this judgment, he's done all these things, what are you going to do in the end? 
You know, false religion will not save you in the end. A false profession of faith will not save you in the end. What are you going to do in the end? And there are some answers that God wants us to find here in, verse, in chapter 6, I believe, to answer that question. What should we do? Look at verse 6. Uh, chapter 6, verse 1, excuse me, um, where we begin to look at what should we do in the end? God asks the question, what will you do in the end? And that remains for God's people to answer. Mainly for you to answer then, for us to answer now, what will we do? How will we respond to warnings around us that we need to put God first? that we need to not forsake God, that we need to fear God, that we need to be right with God, that we need to be sincere with God, the opposite of where Judah found himself, which is why God was doing these things to them. First of all, we need to separate from and warn others that God is going to judge. We need to separate from the people that God is going to judge, and we need to warn them. That's what we find in verse 1. O ye children of Benjamin, gather yourselves to flee out of the midst of Jerusalem, and blow the trumpet in Tekoa. Set up a sign of fire in Beth Arachim, for evil appeareth out of the north, and great destruction. God is bringing judgment on Jerusalem. The people who fear God need to get out of there or they're going to be judged with those people. They need to separate themselves and they need to warn those people. And that's what we need to do today. First of all, we need to put our faith in Jesus Christ for our salvation because this world is going to be judged. Everyone is already condemned by their sins. Jesus didn't come to this world to judge the world. The world was already judged because of our sin. He came to take our place on the cross, to be lifted up, that the world through him might be saved. Everyone who rejects Jesus is already condemned by our sin, by the things that we have already done that break God's law, for which we have to answer for after this life, on the day of judgment. But if we put our faith in Jesus, those sins are paid for. And that faith, if we truly have that faith that we say we have in Jesus, will result in our, separate our separating ourselves from the sins of this world. We need to separate ourselves from those things. Otherwise, we can expect the same judgment if, if, if our profession of faith is just a profession and not real. If it's real, if we believe the building's on fire, you get out of the building and you warn everyone else in the building to get out as well. And that's the situation in Jerusalem. For those who fear God, they need to get out. They need to warn the people in Jerusalem what's coming. Get right with God. Warn other people to get right with God as well. And then also, when God brings judgment, the day leaves, the night settles in. Metaphorically. Things get dark. Look at the following verses. I have likened the daughter of Zion to a comely and delicate woman. The shepherds with their flocks shall come unto her. They shall pitch their tents against her roundabout, and they shall feed everyone in his place. Prepare ye war against her. Arise, and let us go at noon. Woe unto us, for the day goeth away, for the shadows of the evening are stretched out. Darkness is falling on Judah. Darkness is falling in Jerusalem. God is about to bring judgment there. I hope darkness is not falling in America, but morally, spiritually, it has. And so we should expect darkness in other ways to fall if we don't get back to the light, if we don't be the light as believers today, as the church today. Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. No man lighteth a candle and put it under a basket, but on a candlestick, and it gives light to all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Jesus tells his disciples on the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5, 12 through 16. Not only will the darkness settle in here, but wickedness and spoils bring wounds and grief to God. First of all, I believe wickedness grieves God. It wounds him. It was for our sins that Jesus was wounded on the cross. It also brings wounds to those who do not repent. It brings grief in the end. 
look at the following verses here. Verse 7, as a fountain casteth out her water, so she casteth out her wickedness. Violence and spoil is heard in her before me continually is grief and wounds. That's what will come in the end. What will you do in the end? Will you have grief and wounds? Will darkness settle in? Or will you get out? Will you separate from the darkness and be the light and warn those who are still in the darkness? The great problems we see in, in the following verses here is that uh, God's people are covetousness and in, are covetous and insincere. They want things that don't belong to them so much that it upsets their inner peace. That's what their life becomes focused on. And they're not sincere in what they say is most important. Some of us as Christians will admit God is the most important. He is, should have first place. But do we live up to that? Are we sincere? Look at verse 8. Be thou instructed, O Jerusalem, let my soul depart from thee, let, lest I make thee a desolate land and not inhabited. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, they shall thoroughly glean the remnant of Israel as a vine. Turn back thine hand as a grape gatherer into the baskets. To whom shall I speak and give warning that they may hear? Behold, their ear is uncircumcised and they cannot hearken. Behold, the word of the Lord is unto them a reproach. And they have no delight in it. They have not borne the fruit they are called to bear as God's people. Are we bearing God, the fruit for God as God's people today? Are we listening to God? Are we separating ourselves from what is corrupt and listening to God? Verse 11, therefore I am full of the fury of the Lord. I am weary with holding in. I will pour it out upon the children abroad and upon the assembly of young men together. For even the husband with the wife shall be taken, the aged with him that is full of days, and their houses shall be turned unto others and their fields and their wives together. I will stretch out my hand upon the inhabitants of the land, saith the Lord. And there, but look at verse 13. For from the least of them, even unto the greatest of them, everyone is given to covetousness. Again, here's the problem. They're all given to covetousness. They're going into this judgment. They're being judged. They're being warned. And what will they do in the end? Because right now, the problem right now is they're covetous and they're insincere. Everyone is given to covetousness, and from the prophet, even unto the priest, everyone dealeth falsely. They're insincere. They deal falsely. That's where they're at now. Where are they going to be in the end? That is the question they will have to answer, each of them, for themselves. For themselves. They will have to answer that question to God. Where will they be in the end? Because right now, they're, all of them are given to covetousness. All of them are dealing falsely. They're insincere. And that's a problem still today in our country. Are we given to covetousness? Do we let the things that we desire rule us? Are we sincere with God? Or do we deal falsely? It says even the priest, the prophet, the people who say they speak for God here and minister to the people for God are dealing falsely. And today, there are many in religion today that are dealing falsely. They're in it for the money. They're in it for whatever other reason that is not for God. Perhaps it is because of their covetousness is the reason that they're dealing falsely. I'm sure it is right here. They're dealing falsely because they're covetous. So the priests and the prophets say what the people want to hear. They do things that are good for them rather than what God wants because they're covetous. Look at verse 14. They have healed also the hurt of the daughter of my people slightly, saying, peace, peace, when there is no peace. In other words, they're putting makeup on the bruise. They're not actually healing it. They're, they're healing it falsely. They're saying there's peace when there is no peace. Everything's going to get better when it's not getting better. Because they need to deal with the root issue. What's causing the wound? What's causing the hurt? God is allowing these things. What is God doing to us? They need to ask that question. 
and they need to an answer the question, what are they going to do in the end? Look at verse 15. Where were they ashamed? Were they ashamed when they committed abomination? Nay, they were not all ashamed, neither could they blush. Wherefore, they shall fall among them that fall. At the time that I visit them, they shall be cast down, saith the Lord. God's people at this time in history, Judah, lost their ability to be ashamed for doing what's wrong. Today, we're getting that point again where people think that wrong is right and right is wrong, and they lose their ability to even feel bad when they do something that is wrong that we should blush at, that we should know is wrong. When so, you know, some of the things that are said to be funny on TV today are terrible. Should cause someone to blush. Turn it off. Don't watch that. Don't listen to that. But many people today have lost their ability to be ashamed of what is wrong, to blush even. So what should we do in the end? What should we do in the end? Let's look at verse 16. Thus saith the Lord, stand in the ways and see. Ask for the old paths, where is the good way, and walk therein, that ye shall, and ye shall find rest for your souls. The answer, what we should do in the end, find the old paths. Where have you come from? What do we need to get back to? And so Josiah hears from the priest. They've found a copy of the law in the temple. They read it, and he rends his clothes, and they get back to obeying God's law. They break down all the altars, all the idols, all the things that are wrong. And they restore the worship of God. They restore the feast to God under King Josiah. They do get back to the old as under Josiah, but then they forsake those again under his sons. Today, we need to get back to the old paths. Stop trying to make the Bible just relevant for us today and just treat it as a buffet and pull what we want and leave the rest. Let's get back to the old paths. What are we missing from God's word and what can we learn from history and from God's word, including God's people right here in the book of Jeremiah, that we're missing today? Let's get back to those old paths. Instead of trying to invent our own way or reinvent the wheel in some way, modern, let's get back to the old paths. And when we do, when we do, when we find the good way, not the old paths that were wrong, obviously, but the old paths that were the good way and walk therein, when we live that way again, then we find peace, then we find rest for our souls. But it, Judah said, we will not walk therein. They knew what the old paths were and they refused to walk in them. Verse 17, also I set watchmen over you, saying, hearken to the word of the trumpet. But they said, we will not hearken. So God sends messengers. He sends preachers. He sends his word to us and warns us. And yet God's people here did not listen. Will God's people today listen to God? Will we get back to the old ways? What will you do in the end? What will America do in the end? The question remains to be answered today. When fear is on every side, and today there's a lot of fear, there's a lot of worry around the world today about the economy, about the virus, about other things, wars, rumors of wars, like all of those th these things that could, when fear is on every side, what's the answer? The answer when fear is on every side to, is to repent. Call on God. Repent. Go back to God. Turn back to God, as we saw last week. Go back to those old paths, as verse 16 says. Look at verse 17. And I set watchmen over you, saying, Hearken to the sound of the trumpet. But they said, We will not hearken. Therefore, hear ye nations, and know, O congregation, what is among them. Hear, O earth. Behold, I will bring. So God is not just speaking to his people of Judah here. He said, Hear, O earth. That's everyone. That's all of us. Hear, O earth. Behold, I will bring evil upon this people, even the fruit of their thoughts because they have not hearkened unto my words, nor my law, but have rejected it. To what purpose cometh there to me incense from Sheba, and sweet came from a far country? Your burnt offerings are not acceptable, nor your sacrifices sweet unto me. You know, the, the songs that we sing to God, the things that we do to God, even the money that we give to God today, our offerings today, it's not acceptable to God if we continue to live in sin, if we continue not to listen to what he tells us in his word. That's what he wants. He wants obedience and not sacrifice. He wants us to wor worship God in spirit and in truth. 
not in our own imagination, not with our own thoughts, not just with the things that we do, but who we are, what we think, our hearts, putting God first, getting back to those old paths, not picking and choosing what we want from God's word and leaving the rest, but applying in the proper context, obviously understand some things were written to Israel, some things are written to the church, some things are written for us to learn from Israel. Rightly dividing the word of truth, let's get back to all of God's word. Verse 20, to what purpose cometh this, uh, again, God, God says, what good is your incense? What good are the things that you're doing to try and please me if you're not hearing my warnings, if you're not hearing my call to repentance, you're refusing to repent. And because they're refusing to repent, there is fear on every side. And the Israel becomes unusable to God. Look at the end of this passage now. Therefore, thus saith the Lord, behold, I will lay stumbling blocks before this people. And the fathers and the sons shall fall upon them. The neighbor and his friends shall perish. Thus saith the Lord, behold, a people come from the north country. Here specifically speaking of Babylon coming to take Israel, Judah, into captivity. They shall be raised from the sides of the earth. They shall lay hold upon the bow and spear. They are cruel. They have no mercy. Their voice roareth like the sea. And that's a good description of the Syrians, of the Babylonians. And they ride upon their horses to set array as men of war against thee, O daughter of Zion, over to Jerusalem. We have heard the, uh, the fame thereof. Our hands wax feeble, and anguish has taken hold of us, and pain as of a woman in travail. Go now forth into the field, Go not forth into the field, nor walk by the way, for the sword of the enemy and the fear is on every side. Fear is on every side because they've refused to repent. They've refused to ask that question. Why is God doing this to us? They're going to ask it later after this happens to them, as, as we saw in the last passage. Verse 26, O daughter of my people, gird thee with sackcloth and wallow thyself in ashes. Make thee mourning. As for an only son, we need to truly be repentant, truly be contrite, broken in spirit for our sin. Does sin grieve us the way it grieves God? If it doesn't, there's a problem. There's a disconnect between God, our father, and we, his children, if we do not find ourselves grieved by our own sin, not just the sin of other people, but our own sin. If our heart isn't grieved by it, if we don't truly have sorrow for it, and want to get it right, want to be right with God, want to be restored, want to be cleansed, want to walk in those old paths, the good way. Make thee mourning as for an only son. If you lost your only son, you would be that sorrowful. Are we that sorrowful when we sin as if we it lost our only son? I have one son. I, I don't even want to imagine being that sorrowful, but that's how sorrowful we're supposed to be for not putting God first in our life, for not having God and no idol in that place, no imagination of what God is, not the buffet version of God where we pick and choose what we want from the word of God about him and ignore the rest. Not a God in our own image, but we should be mourning as if we lost our only son with bitter lamentation. That's what God is saying here to Judah, that's how they should be mourning for their sin. For the spoiler shall suddenly come upon us. I have set thee for a tower and a fortress among my people, that thou mayest know and try their way. They are all grievous, revolters. You know, God wanting his people to be a tower. He wanted them to stand up for him and point people to God. And they've refused to do that. They've revolted. They've walked with slanders. They are brass and iron. They are corruptors. They're like metal that cannot be worked with. They refuse to be bent and molded and formed the way God wants to shape them. The bellows are burned. The lead is consumed of the fire. The founder melteth in vain. For the wicked are not plucked away. They're refusing to be purged. Like gold or silver is tried in a furnace. Israel, Judah here, has become like metal that the impurities can't be separated out. And therefore, it's good for nothing. It won't mold, be molded and bent into the shape that is useful. So it's unusable. Look at verse 30. Reprobate silver shall men call them because the Lord hath rejected them. Very sad, very 
sad situation that Israel, that Judah found themselves here where God could not use them. And we can still find ourselves in that kind of situation today as God's children. Are we usable by God? Do we separate ourselves from the corruption? Do we allow God to mold us into who he wants us to be so that he can use us as a tool, as an instrument in his hands? Or do we revolt like Israel did against that plan, against that purpose, against that use? We need to separate ourselves from our sins. We need to get back to the old paths. We need to humble ourselves in sorrow for sin. Are we letting this virus crisis around us and the economic crisis that may even be, get worse from here? I hope not. I pray not. Are we allowing it to have ourselves ask, what is God doing? And what are we going to do in the end? Are we allowing ourselves to step back and see what we need to change in our lives? You know, I've, it's been, in some ways, the shutdown has been good for me. This lockdown in Maryland has been good because it's given me the chance to stop and get out of the vicious cycle of busyness, constant busyness, to step back and reevaluate what's most important. First of all, a relationship with God, prayer, being in his word, meditating on those things, thinking about God, First of all, but also family, spending time with them, spending the time with them that I need to, showing them the love that I need to, to train my children up the way that they need to be trained in, in the Lord. And it's been an opportunity to just kind of get out of the cycle, the vicious cycle, having to teach online as, the, as an elementary fourth grade teacher, teach through Zoom, being at home much more now with my family. So there's some benefits. There's some things we can learn from this lockdown. And for you, it might be different. It may be different. But what, in what way does God want to work in your life through this? What is God doing? Let's ask the same questions that God showed us in his word here with Judah. What is our God doing to us was the first question. The second question, and why, excuse me, not what, but why, wherefore? And the reason was they had forsaken him. They had failed to fear God. They were guilty of sin, iniquity, and insincere profession of their faith. Very serious. That's why God was doing all those things. And what will they do in the end? What will we do in the end? That's the second question. And that's a question that remains for us to answer. It remains for Judah to answer for each of themselves. How do we answer that question? What will we do in the end? Let us return. We need to ask for the old paths. As verse 16 in this chapter 6 of Jeremiah told us, ask for the old paths, where is the good way, and walk therein. Let us not forsake God for covetousness, which is idolatry. Let us fear God. Let us confess and forsake our sin. Let's repent. Let's be sorrowful for our sin. And let's get back to the good way and walk in that way in the end, as Judah was called to do here. Then let's see what God will do. Let's close in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for everyone who's joined us through Zoom today for this message from the book of Jeremiah, chapters 5 and 6. Lord, I just pray, Lord, that you continue to work in our hearts as we, we're, we're already at home. There's not a drive on the way home to forget everything. We, we go right back, you know, whether it's preparing for lunch or the rest of our day at home as we log out of Zoom shortly here. Lord, I pray that we'll carry this message with us, that we'll take it to heart, that we'll learn from Judah, that we'll ask these questions in our lives. What, why is God doing this to us? What will we do in the end? Let us, Lord, help us to get back to those, to ask of those old paths and find the good way that we're supposed to walk in with you. I pray that we would walk with you, that we'd have fellowship with you, like we'll look at the type of fellowship we're called to, the type of confidence that we can have in you and in our salvation in Christ that we find in the book of 1 John, as we'll 
be doing tonight in the evening service here on Zoom. Lord, I pray if there's anyone who listens to this message now or later who has never placed their, tr their trust in Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins, believing that Jesus died on the cross, shedding his blood for us and rose again, that Jesus is the Son of God. Lord, I pray that we would search this out further if anyone here has not done so and trust you for salvation. Lord, I pray that we would live up to that, that it would not be a, just a false profession, that it would not be just mere words dealing falsely, Lord, with you and with people that we tell that we're a Christian, Lord, but that we truly would know you, that we'd be rich in you, that we would fear you, that we would repent. Lord, I pray that we would get back to those old paths, those old ways, that we'd inquire, that we'd ask of those and find the good way and walk in it and see you work in our nation in a mighty way. Lord, I pray that you bring revival to our church, to our country, to our state. Lord, please help us. Please be with us in this time of uncertainty, in this time of need in our country, that first of all, our people in this country and around the world, that you would grow the efforts of missionaries, of pastors, of churches, and that there'd be a great revival worldwide, Lord. And today we ask, start this in our hearts. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for joining us this morning. We'll continue tonight at 6 o'clock in a study in 1 John. Wednesday night we'll be here at 6.30. And I plan to, be, again, bring a message from Ezra for, uh, before our prayer meeting. 6.30 Wednesday. Thank you for joining us today for this morning service here at the Bible Church of Lakeshore. If you have any questions, comments, of course, if you're on Zoom right now, I invite you to stay and visit or chat a little bit afterward if you'd like. Also, you can contact us through the website, the contact us part of our website, uh, or call our, or, our church or, or myself, and uh, we'd love to hear from you and hear any way that we can pray for you. God bless.